Hello and welcome to Black Man Lab. This is Marty Monaghan and I am here with my brother Joe Barker. We are going to be having a great conversation today um, around leadership and coaching. Uh, before we get started, I want to just kind of open it up and tell you where Black Man Lab comes from. Black Man Lab started about four years ago. Brother, our brother Maoli Davis and uh, three other brothers from the organization of Let Us Make Man started a, uh, a group together of, of, of fathers that really just wanted to be able to get together with their sons and share information with their sons because we know so often that our sons as fathers just sometimes don't listen to us. So we bring in those uncles, those other close friends that um, can, you know, as we say, from where I grew up at, uh, put a little fat on your head, help you to learn about life and things that, that life has to offer. So um, that grew into what we have today. Uh, normally we meet in person every Monday, uh, obviously during these COVID times, we are doing this now via Zoom um, so that we are able to broadcast uh, throughout the country, uh, a little different than, than um, what we normally are doing here in Atlanta. Uh, so it gives us the ability to kind of expand and bring in brothers from around the country to uh, help to bring information for our young folks. Um, so each week we are meeting here uh, and doing these, these discussions around various topics. Today, we are talking about uh, leadership and coaching and um, all those things that go with, with coaching and what it can lead to as far as helping our young men become leaders in their communities. Um, with that, I want to introduce my brother, Joe Barker, who is going to be uh, co-hosting with me tonight. Brother Joe. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing? I hope everybody's okay. Appreciate you guys joining us this evening. Thank you for the, the coaches that are with us. And we're going to get into the introductions here shortly. Um, I see Brother Jared. Uh, appreciate you as always, good brother. Um, and, and just thanks for, for all y'all that are tuning in with us. It's going to be a great conversation. It's it's not going to be just the normal uh, coaching, which there's nothing normal about it. Uh, probably everybody on this panel uh, hosting and, and visiting with us has, has, has coached and done some other things. But it's about the leadership, the leadership that we transition into, the leadership that we transition these youth into through those opportunities. So it's really a good conversation for this evening. Hope you're, the young man can join in with us tonight. So thanks again, Marty, and uh, let's get it started. Absolutely. So we have some traditions that we do every week uh, to kind of help us to get centered and help us to get um, in the space of uh, being open and willing to take in information. A lot of times what we have is the weight of the world on our shoulders as Black men in terms of the things that we are weighed down with every day, whether it's uh, currently COVID or uh, racial unrest or whatever it might be that's, that's weighing us down. But we want this space be one that we are uh, being as sacred and one full of love. So we are open to allow ourselves to take on um, information. I mean, that's us as, as those of us on this panel, as well as those that are listening. So there's a couple of traditions that we do every week. One of which is uh, we help to get centered through our breathing. And I'm gonna ask brother Joe Barker to go ahead and do that for us, Joe. Normally we'd have our brother Fred here. Fred's working on his PhD. so. Um, going to ask Joe to take care of it for us today. And I tell you what, what I learned, I learned from Fred Parham. So um, I'm, I'm, I'll try and do a, be a decent substitute for him tonight. So, you know, as Marty said, when we started Black Man Lab, when we were at the Y, you know, every week we, we come together, we're mentoring, we're, we're creating a safe and sacred space. But with all the, the burdens and everything on us, you know, we, we come to those spaces with some challenges, with some, some weight on us. And we just get in that space and we, we, we're there for one another. Um, we, we check on one another. We, we hug up on our brothers for those that might need some, some love. Just know, hey, we got you and we're gonna be okay. We can't be in that space right now, though soon we will be navigating back towards that. So for right now, we've, we've been doing some, some breathing exercises, just taking a couple of deep breaths and breathing out, just letting that, that positive energy come in and exhaling those negative energies and burdens that are thrust upon us. So I'd ask for all of y'all that are able to join us, just if you could with me, just take a deep breath. 
and breathe it out and exhale, exhale. And just let that negative energy get, get out of there. Let that negative energy go back out into the universe and bring in that positive energy that the brothers and the coaches that are on here are breathing life into us with. So let's, uh, let's get one more of those. Let's take a deep breath in and exhale it out. And with that, you know, let's go on to uh, our next tradition. All right, thanks brother Joe, appreciate that. Again, as Joe said, normally when we are in the same space, um, we just reach out to the, to the brothers that are there in the room and say, hey, who here could use some um, Black Man Lab love? Meaning we, we don't ask any questions, we just wanna say, hey, if you got issues, you got the weight of the world on your shoulders. We are here for you. And we just wrap our arms around those, those brothers. We can't do it here in this virtual space, but just know that we are we are loving all y'all brothers out there in all of our communities. Exactly. So thanks for that, Brother Joe. Um, next, we always want to talk about those that we stand on the shoulders of that came before us, our ancestors. We know that we would not be in this space today if we didn't have those that came before us. Um, and it's important that we honor those people. That we, we make sure that we let them know, their spirit know that we are here because of them. So with that, I want to bring in my brother, Brother Jared Grant, to uh, bring the ancestors into the space. Brother Grant. Brother Marty, Brother Joe, and uh, our special guests, uh, thank you all and welcome, brothers. Um, we always want to start off with um, um, bringing our ancestors in our hearts and mind, those who came before us. We want to put them in our thoughts and mind um, and, and just pay homage um, to the fact that we're here and, and that we're, we're raising ourselves based on the knowledge and, and sacrifices made by our ancestors. So um, at this time, just think about some of those great ancestors in our history um, that, that caused us to be where we are today um, um, in, the, in the best and greatest light. Think of some of those ancestors right now and hold them in your hearts and mind. Hold them in your hearts and minds for a few seconds. And now on the count of three, I want everybody to raise their fists and everybody say, Ashe, one, two, three, Ashe, all right. Now we have ancestors that created us that are in our own bloodline. Those who actually created you in your own bloodline. Uh, I want you to think about them. Think about those who made you, um, that helped lead you to where you are actually today, who created you. Bring them into your hearts and mind. Think about those ancestors at this time. Now I want everybody to raise your fist and on the count of three, say Ashe, Ashe. I want to thank you all, brothers, for uh, um, bringing this space and creating space for our ancestors to, to join us in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jared, man. Appreciate that. Without further ado, I want to go ahead and get into this conversation, man, because I think it's one that's it's, it's important. And not only that, but it's one that's near and dear to my heart as I um, have spent some time as a coach in my past, as a basketball coach in high school. and. Not only that, my father uh, was a basketball coach for 40, almost 49 years um, in both grammar school and high school. So I grew up in the coaching world. Um, and so this is near and dear to my heart. And I want this conversation uh, to get started. But with that, I want if each of you brothers to give a quick introduction of yourself, um, our coaches that are on the panel, give a quick introduction of yourself. And then after that, we're going to get a deeper dive in. So um, I'm going to start with you, Brother Hardy, if you can give an introduction. Thanks, Marty. Uh, appreciate you, brothers, for having me on. Uh, long, long history of being in this sport. Basketball has been, been uh, sort of the focal point of my life. I uh, grew up outside Chicago, uh, played. I know uh, we got some fellow Catholic League folks on, on from Chicago Catholic League. Uh, went on from there, played at Northwestern, uh, four-year starter at Northwestern. From there, played in Europe. Uh, came back, wanted absolutely nothing to do with sports. 
uh, took a job at JP Morgan uh, doing corporate finance and investment banking. I uh, was there for three years, coached AAU on the side just because I was asked to do it. Uh, no reason other than that. Uh, sparked a passion to coaching I didn't know existed. Uh, led me to take an assistant coaching job at Northwestern, my alma mater. So I was there for seven years as assistant coach and associate head coach. Left there, went to Georgetown. Um, worked at Georgetown for three years. Left there, went to Georgia Tech down in Atlanta. Coached there for two years as assistant coach and then uh, got my first head coaching job here at Loyola University, Maryland in Baltimore and uh, started my third season now here in Loyola. Awesome, man. So glad to have you on as well as being a fellow Catholic leaguer, man. <laughs> so glad to have you on, brothers. Appreciate you. Right. Um, my man, brother Travis Williams. Grab you muted, bro. You're on mute, Travis. My bad. There Sorry you go. About that. Sorry about that. Good seeing you guys, man. T. Hardy, good seeing you, man. Always, brother. Jay Thompson, all these guys, pretty much I know. But, man, appreciate you having me on there. Uh, my name is Travis Williams, former 18-year uh, college, high school, semi-pro, international coach. Uh, I'm a South Georgia guy from Tip Tipton, Georgia. Played at Tip County High School. Uh, played at Georgia State from the early 90s, 91 to 96, 95, 96. Um, um, tried to play professional, didn't work out, but had an opportunity to come and get it started in the business with the left-hander, Charles Lefty Drizelle, uh, coached at my alma mater, Georgia State, from 99 to 2003. Uh, won a few championships and got into business from working with Lefty, then left there and went to uh, Chicago State for a year. Uh, then I moved back to Atlanta when we, uh, the semi-pro launch was uh, WBA, World Basketball Association. So I had an opportunity to be the assistant GM and associate head coach with my man, Latira Green. We won the inaugural season championship in the World Basketball Association, the Peachtree Southern Crescent Lightning. So I don't know if y'all familiar with that. They had Tree Rollins, Chucky Brown. I mean, it was a really good league. Um, and so left there, and then during that time, I. Got an opportunity to be the head coach at Fort Valley, at Fort Valley State University at the age of 30. So I was there for uh, three years as a head coach. And then my man, Mark Sloniker, who was the head coach at Mercer University at the time, said, hey, you want to get back to Division I? You know, I, I couldn't pass it up, the opportunity to go back to Division I. So I was at Mercer University for a year, 2007-2008. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, they let Sloniker go uh, during that year. And then I got an opportunity to go coach in China. I always wanted to coach internationally, so that was a big time after we won the 2008 Olympic gold. So I had the opportunity to go in and coach uh, in China, which was a great experience. Great experience. Um, went 11 and 2 in friendly games, and a good friend of mine, John Cooper, get the head coaching job at Tennessee State University and said, Hey, hey, you want to come on back to the States? So I said, Hey, got an opportunity to come back and be uh, Coop's top assistant at at Tennessee State for three years, and then he got the opportunity to move on to Miami, Ohio, and then I, I became the head coach at Tennessee State University for a few years. And so after that, you know, they ended up letting me go the second year, but then again, I launched my business, Academic and Athletic Consultant, and then convinced my wife to move back to Atlanta, Georgia. And so, of course, I got back to Atlanta, then they convinced me to coach high school ball at the Maynard H. Jackson High School here in Atlanta. So I got a chance to go full circle. And so I was the head coach at Maynard Jackson for two years. Went back to back state uh, tournament appearance, first region championship last year, went uh, 25 and three, um, won the region sweet 16. And then opportunity, Ron Harner called me and brought me back home after 15 years. And so 2018-19 season, we won the Sun Belt back to back championships. Uh, went to the NCAA tournament. Uh, we lost to Kelvin Sampson University of Houston in the first round. And as you know, Ron Herner took the job at Tulane University. I was named the interim head coach for a few weeks until they brought in Rob Lanier. And so uh, the opportunity um, uh, didn't get opportunity to stay on staff. But as that happened, I had an opportunity to launch HBCU All-Star Game that was scheduled to play during the final four weekend, college basketball's biggest weekend. We were two and a half weeks out, and we were going to have the best of our black college basketball here playing at Morehouse College Forbes Arena. 
We call it Team John McClendon versus Team Clarence Big House Gaines. And we had this uh, MEAC and the SIC versus the SWAC and the CIAA. All, and also we included Tennessee State and Hampton, although they moved to PWIs and the OVC and the, uh, I think it's the Big South Hampton in. So we had an opportunity a few weeks out. And so, uh, and then during that time, as y'all know, all the social injustice landscape hit with the George Florida Maud Aubrey. So in June of this year, Marty, as you had attested to it, you got an opportunity. I started Coaches for Change Movement, and we did a big rally in March at the State Capitol Liberty Plaza directly across from Martin Luther King statue on one Martin Luther King Drive. And what's so significant about that on state capitol ground. And so we had a lot of coaches on all levels that came out and really showed their support. And so it's been a movement, you know, as you can attest to, uh, Coach Hardy, you, you've been around and I know you guys are using y'all voices, using y'all platform with 100%, you know, voter participation and all that stuff. So. Here we are now, and so hopefully, just met with the NCAA, we still gonna revisit that 2021, the first ever HBCU All-Star game that's going on in um, in the Indianapolis. So we're gonna try to push forward with that. And also, uh, I'm the president and CEO of Academic and Athletic Consultant, empowering and mentoring our student athletes. And as a matter of fact, I have a session this week, so we do a monthly Zoom session where I have actually scheduled this Wednesday Tim, um, uh, we have Tim Duncan, the athletic director of New York University of New Orleans, Monique Holland, senior women administrator at Auburn University. Uh, we have Yasir Roseman come to speak. So we have a list of uh, uh, figures and leading experts coming through and pouring in our kids on Wednesday. So, but that's where we are with uh, Coaches for Change, Academic Athletic Consultant, the whole nine. Hey, Travis, that's a hell of a resume, brother. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Oh, we're glad to have you all, man. Thanks. And, and uh, you know, some of that we'll get into even a little bit more as we move forward and talk about um, justice and things of that nature. Um, brother Jermaine, good to see you, man. Jay. Give a little introduction of yourself, brother. You're on mute, by the way. There you okay. Go. There you go. How y'all doing? Good, brother. Good to see you. Coach Tavares. Coach Trav, you see how what's going on. I, I appreciate y'all having me on here today, man. Thank you. Um, just briefly, um, I grew up in White Plains, New York. Um, uh, played football, basketball, so in high school. But my dad was um, a Rucker legend. And um, also, he he's a Harlem legend, and he, he ran a youth organization called Young Life in New York City. And um, the likes of El Elton Brand, uh, um, uh, Rayford Austin, um, um, uh, Stephon Marbury started with him, from, left him at 13, played for him with like 8 to 13. So I, I grew up, and he had us playing in New York City, uh, the Rucker and all that stuff. So I kind of grew up in it. We actually, you know, took mm -hmm. over um, the New York City youth basketball from 80, from like the, the late 80s to early 90s. And I was with the Riverside, Gauchos, you know, all the, all the main players, We, you know, Young Life took over. So I was just a part of that whole it was a movement. You ask anybody who came up in the 80s about Young Life they, in New York, they know. So I, I just came up in it. So my father a, became a coaching legend as well in New York City. So I, I ended up going to um, Florida A&M University. Um, um, I walked on the football team, played for a few years, and then I started a youth organization, um, uh, uh, which was uh, called Young and Striving and pretty much took athletes and we brought them up on campus and we tutored them during football season we would take them to football practice after they got their homework done and so forth then we started basketball then during the basketball basically basketball they were they were, they were mine and pretty much started a, a movement down there man i had the top team one of the top teams in florida when i was in college with with, with this young group and um and then just move forward, man. After I graduated, I moved. I moved here to Atlanta. Um, started coaching. I coached at Southwest Atlanta Christian Academy um, in 2006. 
um, girls. So I, I came right when Dwight went pro. So it was like a it was like a huge movement there, man. Like, but it was all about the boys. And um, so they they hired me, and before I got there, the girls hadn't won more than 10 games, you know. And uh, within two years, we won the state championship. And we won, actually won a double state championship with the boys. Um, that Javaris Crittenton, his senior year, which I'm sure we're going to talk about Javaris as well, because I watched Javaris from, I've known him since he was a little kid, but I watched him close up in high school from 14 all the way on up. I watched, I know why he's where he is right now. I saw it firsthand. I was close with Javaris and, um, this I, I, this is really the reason why we're having Javaris's situation, Javaris Crittenton situation, is really kind of the reason why we're having this right now. Because you know, it's 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 it, it. We got so much responsibility, man. Um, as as coaches, you know what I'm saying. Um, so much responsibility as coaches, we got so much power and we have to understand the power that we have. Whoa, lost you. No, you good. Got you. Y'all still see me? Yeah. Yep, we got you, brother. I can't see y'all, but, um, but, um, but, 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 but I just think that we, you know, as coaches, we have so much power, man. And, and I've been a part of growing up in my childhood and, you know, through college, just been a part of coaches um, that were great coaches and coaches that were horrible coaches that break that that break your spirit. And um, we just got to understand it's, it's, it's really everything that we put into them on the court, on the field follows, you know, is, 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 is parallel to what they're doing off the field and off the court. And right now, especially right now, with everything that's going on, we have so much responsibility. So, you know, we 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 have to take we have to take this responsibility serious. So I just appreciate you having me on this panel right now, man, because um this is this is this is we got a lot of power. We got a lot of power, man. And um absolutely um, that's, we, that's, uh... we can direct these kids, man, and, and these these kids got so much power and influence, man. As young kids, man, they got they 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 they're more impressionable with their peers than the pros, and and so we just can we just can guide it, man. But anyway, that's me in a nutshell. Me in a nutshell. Absolutely, there's, there's so much to talk about um, as it relates to that that particular part of the topic, right? Because we're talking about <clears throat> coaching and leadership, right? Um, we want our young folks to have a level of understanding of that it's not just about being that player. It's also about being that leader, right? Yes. Uh, you can be a leader it's on your team, and you, you typically find that um, that person that's a great leader on a basketball team that does not wind up going on to, um, you know, being a professional athlete, or maybe they are, um, but they also wind up being really good coaches because they have an idea around, what it looks like to be a leader. And it doesn't necessarily mean the, the best player on the team. Right. You know, sometimes people are leaders on their team and they're not the actual best player on the team. Right. Um, but we'll get into that too. I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Joe. Joe, um, did you want to jump in with a question and kick us off? I did, man. I did. Thank you, Marty. So, so you brothers, man, like you, you're exactly the passion for which you answered. Even the introduction is exactly why we're having this conversation. Um, and I'm gonna start with my my rattler. I came out of family you in '93. Salute! Oh um, yo, that came out '95. What up, rattler? I do, I do. You got it, baby. But I want all y'all to answer the same thing, though, man. But like, as we progress on to the situation, like with Javaris Crichton that you're talking about, and so forth, I want to know for you brothers when y'all were younger, because we got young brothers that are chiming in, they, they making comments, they, they tuning into the lab here, you know? When y'all were younger, man, what is it that you all saw? What coach, what what parent? I know you mentioned something, Brother Jermaine. Who was it that, that looked at, that you said, sports is a path that I gotta take, not just because I necessarily wanna be 
a, a professional ball player, but because I see it helping me build character. I see it helping me develop my leadership abilities. Let's start with what was your path? I know, um, uh, Coach Williams, you talked about it a little, little bit, and I know we, you, you did a great job of that, but I want to unpack that because I want the younger brothers to hear what, what happened when you all were younger to say, that's what I know I got to do. Let's start with you, Brother Jermaine. Well, I mean, like I said, I don't, <laughs> um, growing up, you know, I had an older brother. and my, Like I said, my father was literally, like my father, you know, he came up with Earl, he grew up with Earl Manigault, Pee Wee Kirkland. When Pee Wee Kirkland came here to Atlanta, he stayed with my father. You know what I'm saying? They they born on the same day. He, uh, you know, Kareem, all of them. So he just grew up in it, man. And um, so I really just was kind of just, really just, just in it, you know? Um, and I saw the influence that my dad had, man. Like it was, it was magnetic, man, how he could just change the culture of Westchester County. You know what I'm saying? He was from Harlem. We lived up in Westchester County, White Plains, New York. And he changed the, the basketball culture of a whole suburb. <laughs> and um, he, he brought New York City and Westchester together, man. And so I was just a part of that. And I just, I, just the, the, the swag of athletes, the, the power, the, the influence, the how people, you know, what these young kids have to understand and what coaches have to really, everybody needs to overstand is that as an athlete, you're going to get special privileges. That's just, that just comes with it, man. I, I'm not saying it's good, it's bad, but I'm saying it can be bad if it's not handled correctly. You know what I'm saying? If, 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 if it's not handled correctly, man, it, it, it can be disastrous. So um, I just watched my pops. It was, it was that, I mean, I was very good in sports. Like I, I, was, I was a very good athlete, but it was the whole being an athlete and that whole world, man, that I just wanted to be a part of, man. You know, <laughs> the locker room. The, the brotherhood, you know what I'm saying? It, it really didn't matter whether you was white, black, or whatever, that that sports is that common ground, man. You know what I mean? I dig that. I dig that. And these brothers need to hear that. So that that's great. I, I love the way you ended that, man, because these young brothers need to hear that, especially in this racially charged environment that we're navigating through. Hey, look, there's a common denominator that you just brought up like that. Appreciate that. Yeah. What about you, Coach Williams? Uh, for me, you know, when I'm interested you being from South Georgia, so me right. coming up, I mean, I experienced tragedy at such an early age. So, so I had a mom, my mom passed away at age 30. I was 12 years old at the time. She passed away from lupus. And so you can imagine, you know, just having been an opportunity, being juggled, single parent, no father figure around. And so me, it was just trying to different, just trying to uh, figure out the situation. And so fortunately, I was able to use sports to stay out the streets, um, to keep me focused. And it came down to a relationship with my coaches. One reason I'm coaching to this day is because the relationship of my coaches and the impact and how they poured into my lives. And I remember like yesterday, you know, um, you know, Going into my junior year, my, my coach asked me, he said, what do you want to do, Travis? I said, first of all, I'm going to the military. And he was like, you going to the military? And I said, yeah. He said, you ever thought about college? And I'm like, college? College not for me. I never, no one in my family attended college. I was never exposed to college. So when you were growing up in a household and let you know that's just the socioeconomic background where I grew up, if you grow up in a, in a background like that, you're never exposed to it, so you don't know what it's about. And so the only thing I saw was watching TV. They say going to the military or something like that. And so my coach said, Tommy Blackshear, who just got the head coach job back at Tip County High School. Now he said, you're going to college. I said, what do you mean, coach? He said, he took me down to the counselor's office, pulled up my grades, looked at my transcript, make sure I was on the college prep track. And he said, you're going to college. And of course, I became a pretty good basketball player to sign a basketball scholarship at George State. So what motivated me and fueled me was like, I did not use my mom as a death, her death as a reason not to be successful. Mm -hmm. 
Got you. You see what I'm saying? So it kind of motivated me. It drove me and said, hey, I'm going to get this high school degree and dedicate it to my mom. I'm going to sign this basketball scholarship and dedicate it to my mom. I'm going to be the first in my family to attend college and graduate and dedicate it to my mom. First in my family to get my master's degree by age 23 and dedicate it to my mom. So I had other reasons on why. You see what I'm saying? So I was like, listen, I can't go back to Tilton. Didn't want to go back to that environment. So I wanted to set example for all my cousins to let them know, hey, Travis went to college. So in other words, we ready to break generational curses. So my mindset was like, hey, it was something that was instilled in me to say, hey, I want to be a success story. I don't want to live in poverty like a lot of my other family members. So I just had that feeling. And the, and the back thing that kept driving me was like, what would my mother wanted me to do? And so that kind of drove me, even when I went to college, uh, even getting into coaching and just the relationships. Because like I mentioned to you, I remember writing a project in grad school. They say, hey, what do you vision yourself? In the next five years, I had to write a project. I said, I vision myself uh, finishing my master's degree and probably getting in some coaching in some capacity. But that was, you know, just have to put it down. But like I said, one reason I'm coaching and how it unfolded to this day because of the relationship I had with my high school basketball coach and the relationship I had with the coach Carter Wilson, who recruited me to Georgia State at the time, and Bob Reinhardt, who was a former Atlanta Hawks coach. So it was relationship driven for me and also just taking advantage of an opportunity of a full ride basketball scholarship mm -hmm. and taking advantage of education. In other words, using basketball and not allowing basketball to use me. So that what kind of drove me uh, in, as a former student athlete and as a coach. Awesome. Awesome, man. What a, what a story. What a story. How about you, Coach Hardy? Yeah, I mean, you know, the fellas got some, 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 some great stories. Uh, I would say for me, you know, the first person was my mother. Uh, she grew up in segregated Mississippi. Uh, migrated us up to Chicago, you know, single parent mom, three kids, you know, she, she wasn't college educated. So she wasn't preaching to us, you know, all this stuff about what to do in school and what we need to try to be when we grow up. You know, she taught us like, you know, work hard. If you say you're going to do something, do it like just basic concepts, but it resonated with us. One thing I will say she did that was kind of unique in our neighborhood. She did put us in sports early. Uh, not a lot of kids in our neighborhood was, was, was playing like on the organized teams. We all played in the park. We all played, uh, you know, in between the apartment buildings. That's where we played football. <laughs> but, but nobody was really going out and playing, um, you know, on the little league team. And, and my mom put us in that stuff. I don't know why, but it helped us. Uh, yeah. I would say probably the most influential thing that happened. And I don't even know how it went down. So I was a troublemaker uh, all throughout. I had great grades. Uh, my brother and sister were older. Uh, they got good grades as well, but they were more, they were more uh, in tune with doing what was right than I was. Uh, but my older sister kind of set the tone for our family. Uh, as an eighth grader, graduating eighth grade, she made a decision to go to a private high school outside of our city, 20 minutes away. We couldn't afford it. My mom said, you want to do it, you got to work. And so I remember, you know, I'm in fourth grade at the time, I remember in the summers, you know, we, we're jumping in my mama Toyota Tercel. We all six, six and above, <laughs> or not, not at the time, but we tall. We jumping in the Tercel to go pick up my sister from, from Providence to high school. And like everybody around her is these big white football dudes. And you got this skinny black girl painting the buildings and trimming the hedges and doing whatever she needed to do to pay the tuition. And, you know, for me, that kind of, resonated with me to see how hard she was working to, to, to get this opportunity. She ended up going there. She hadn't really played sports outside of like the little youth league stuff. She ends up getting a full ride volleyball scholarship per, to Purdue University in the Big Ten four years later. And, and that kind of changed the trajectory of our family. I'm coming into high school as she's graduating. I now have a different focus. Uh, was able, like Travis said, to use basketball to get me out of trouble. Uh, use basketball to get me to where I needed to be. And I would say going to that school, what I learned was how to play the game. Uh, I, I was smart enough to be there. I was talented enough to be there, but I needed to curve some of my, 
my, my attitude, uh, I still be myself, still express my opinions, but not get so uh, angry when people disagree with me. I had to learn how to do that. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, in navigating that over those four years of high school, you know, I had great coaches. My eighth grade coach was good. My high school coach, I got the combination. So my, my, my high school coach was more skill development, taught me the fundamentals. And then I played AAU ball for the Illinois Warriors. Y'all may have heard of us. The Atlantic Celtics guys, we used to smack y'all around. Riverside Church, we beat y'all in the championship of the Peach Jam. So, you know, I just want to let all y'all Atlanta and New York guys know no we, dom we, we dominated AAU ball yeah. back in our day. But that combination of, of, of the structure I got at the high school and then just playing with great players, Quinn Richardson, Corey McGetty, uh, you know, our program was, was phenomenal. We got an incredible amount of Division I basketball coaches now. Like, they toughened me up. Uh, and that led me to be able to go in, into a Big Ten program and start as a freshman. And once I got exposed to all that, fellas, that's when my life started to change. You look at my coaching path, it, it mirrors where I went to school. When I got to Northwestern, I saw what this world was really all about. I saw what athletics can do. And, and, and Jermaine, you mentioned it earlier, using, using ball, not letting it use you. Like once I learned how to do that with a, with a powerful school like Northwestern at, at my uh, fingertips, the sky was the limit. And that's why I've been able to navigate my career. And that's my, that's my why and why I'm coaching uh, to, to introduce more young brothers and not just the brothers. I mean, we recruit everybody, but introduce student athletes to this opportunity uh, and especially the brothers to, to show them, you know, outside of everything that's going on in the world, uh, you too can be a part of something special. You too can, can navigate these waters and, and get people to buy into you being successful and being a leader in this society. So that's why I do what I do and, and uh, been able to navigate my career accordingly. Man, that's awesome. I, I love the young brothers hearing all y'all say the same message that, you know, use the sport, don't let the sport use you. And I see y'all success and y'all's passion and you clearly have used it to become the leaders in the communities and the different realms that you are. And I love that these brothers can hear you say that, that you didn't just wake up and say, I'm gonna start a business, I'm gonna do this. Like you molded a path for you through sports and use that to form yourself into these leaders. That's, that's good stuff, man. That's what they need to hear, man. Yeah, absolutely right, Joe. Um, and and um, Brother Hardy, you, you kind of transitioned there into um, what I would like to segue into, which is talking about um, getting our young folks to look at coaching um, as a, one, as a career, but then also as a means of, um, I, I, what we see today is we see a lot of young folks, that, at least me, I've seen a lot of young folks that showed some leadership qualities. Um, and those are the people that we want to wrap our arms around and make sure that they're getting um, that direction on, on how to get to uh, being a good leader for, for family, for the community, for the, for the country, for the world, right? Um, and in that order. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about those leadership qualities. And as you guys are coaching, what are you seeing um, when you when you have your opportunities, what are you seeing um, with your young folks, uh, and how do you try to bring that to the surface that, that lead to those leadership qualities? And brother Hardy, I'll start with you on that. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, you know, we have a lot of talented uh, natural leaders in our communities. Uh, but what, what I'll say is this, I think we get a little skewed in our vision of what success is supposed to look like as black men. Uh, and it's part based on what we see on TV, social media was mentioned earlier. And so we have to reimagine and, and it, it's on us as leaders, it's on the parents, it's on the coaches as leaders. We have to reimagine in our kids' minds what success is. And so, yes, we all want to go out and one day be LeBron James and, you know, beyond that, there's so many prominent athletes that I could name. Uh, we can all go out and be talented artists. Um, you know, obviously 
President Obama set the stage to show we can be president. But there's a lot of there's a lot of people who aren't on TV who are having successful lives that we need to start to to push our young men to aspire to be like. And that's a hard story, fellas. I tell you, uh, I, I have a call that I do every Sunday uh, with a group of first time black head coaches in the first five years on our jobs. That's how I found out about this, to be honest, uh, Lance Irvin. We, we talk about a lot of things. And one thing we all struggle with is getting our young men to realize that you have to pursue excellence in everything you do inclusive of basketball, but also inclusive of everything else, inclusive of academics, inclusive of being a great leader, inclusive of your impact on your community. And that's what our culture is built on. But sometimes young men or their parents feel like when you start talking about those things, you're, 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 you're basically downplaying their athletic ability. You're saying they can't make it. That's not what we're saying. We're saying it's both and. It's not either or. You can be both a great basketball player, be all ACC where I coached or Big East or Big Ten or Patriot League where I'm coaching now, pursue professional basketball, you know, Georgetown's long list of pros, Georgia Tech long list of pros, Josh Kogi, like you, you can do that. But then at some point, the ball's gonna stop bouncing. Right. Whether you're 22, 32, 42. And what I want, what I aspire for our young men is when that happens, you're in a position of power. You're in a position to choose what you want to do and how you want to do it, not just rely on somebody giving you an opportunity. And, and that's the message that I want to deliver to our young men is you want to choose, you want to have a position of power. And so utilize the game, utilize your academic experience to maximize that power. Uh, and, and, and take advantage of all the different leadership opportunities. I got my guys, one of my players, uh, he's playing professionally now, just graduated. Last year, he was the president of SAC, which is our Student Athlete Advisory Committee, the only black president of SAC uh, in our conference. You know, they, they take the picture of everybody and, you know, <laughs> you just got the one brother, everybody else is not. <laughs> uh, but I was so proud of him for, for being that, being the president of SAC, he was on a, a committee that reported right to our president. Like those things I encourage our student athletes to be a part of, because that's what the, the, the decision makers and the folks who want to help you, and I don't mean give you an opportunity, but invest in your business, they're looking for those types of things. And so don't, 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 don't uh, push those things to the side, just thinking I can only be a ball player. That would be my main message to these young leaders. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that that speaks to, um, kind of what the Black Man Lab is actually about. We we want to make sure that these young brothers out there and, and sisters as well, um, but really have a level of realization that there is greatness within you. There's greatness within you because of all those that came before you. There's greatness within you because quite honestly, I believe that us in, as Black folk as have evolved to the point that we have to be great, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, overcome all the different challenges that we've had to overcome. Um, there's a certain sense of evolution that has occurred um, for us to both be creative and innovative mm -hmm. in how we get along through life. And when we realize that, we take that creativity and that innovation and bring it through with leadership, it gives you folks like you guys, right? That are, that are great at leading other people. And not, but not only that, great at also getting other people to want to lead, right? Somebody influenced you to get to that. I, I watched my dad coach for umpteen years and I saw him do it the right way every day. And that's what made me want to do it too. I probably would still be doing it to this day if life hadn't gotten away and I had to, you know, go up. Because y'all know as co coaches early on, the money ain't, ain't there. But, you know, if it, sometimes life gets in the way it makes you better food and doing something else. But, um, it's still in me and it's still in the way that I lead in the work that I do on a daily basis. And I know most of us have that in us as well. Um, I jumped to you, brother Jermaine, same question to you, man. What do you, what do you do for the young folks? You're on mute, by the way. Yeah, I kind of feel, I, I, you know, the, the culture of the, the sports culture, man, and I've been, like I say, my, um, 
I, I, I've, I've really experienced it very close with these at a pretty high level with these, with, with, with the high school, like elementary all the way pretty much to high school because I had a, an AAU program that had, my son had Anthony Edwards, who might be the number one draft pick this year. Um, um, Chris Hinton, who's at University of Michigan right now, football. Um, Munir McClain, he's at USC football right now. My son, who's at Campbell University right now. Um, I had these guys all the way from eight all the way to 13. And we were top five in the country every year, pretty much. It just, it just fluctuated, you know? And um, to be at that level, because I'm telling you, the, 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 everything that's coming at these kids, even at 11, 12 years old, when you're playing at, at, you know, at that high level, man, um, you just see, you see the negative of the culture of sports. They don't, it's, you know, think about this, man. You got the Nike circuit, you got the Adidas circuit, you got the Under Armour circuit. This, these circuits have thousands and thousands of kids, thousands, man, playing in, in, in different cities all, all spring and summer, right? You mean to tell me there's not one workshop that is, is, is pouring into the kids? You got all these ki elite kids together, elite athletes together, and nobody is, nobody is pumping into them, okay, life after sports. The ball's going to stop bouncing, careers and sport. You know what I'm saying? It's just all about, it's all about beat rankings. <laughs> on uh, social media, being the best. So we steer, you know, this is supposed to be recreation. And if you break down recreation, it's recreation. And what are we recreating, man, with the, you know, you know, with the culture, man, like the, all they care about, you know, all they care about is kids running and jumping, running and jumping, who can score. And I think that is a, it, it, nothing's being poured into them. So, and this is what I mean by, coaches you know coaches really feeding the kid because the culture takes from them man only one percent of these kids are going to go play division one basketball one percent i'm talking about out of thousands of kids man one percent and nothing so when the boss so these kids they listen to social media you know all that and when the when, when it stops i've seen where these kids go into depression. Look, think about this, man. Deion Sanders was one of the, one of the most decorated athletes ever. And when the, when it stopped, when it, the, the crowd stopped going, Deion tried to commit suicide, man. You know what I mean? So, what I'm saying is, we have to be as coaches and trainers. Like I'm a full time trainer right now. We have to be so intentional intentional about feeding these kids the right substance man i'm telling i'm telling you man i'm i, I see um you know like anthony edwards ant-man as we call him like i said he spending the night at my house him and my son like i mean the whole crew they still in the group text together i'm saying <laughs> just see him the, the, the see it because he was you know, number one pick and going to college to see everything that was coming at him, man. You know what I'm saying? To watch him, these kids get, if you're an elite athlete, you get pulled away, man. You know what I'm saying? You get pulled away from really what's important <laughs> because now it's just, it's, it's fool's gold, man. And so as coaches, as trainers, we have, I mean, we have to be so intentional about man having these kids um focus on other things man you know think about i, I know for me if i was in high school and somebody would have came in and said hey this is a career in sports like this different careers in sports you know what i'm saying like i would i probably would 
would have been on a whole nother path, man. You know what I'm saying? Earlier. Because, but nobody ever came and said, this is careers. It's thousands of jobs in sports. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and athletes want to stay in it. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just saying, you know, we just need to, I, 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 I wanted to really, really get, because I watched, we see, we see the culture suck these kids dry. It's happening, man. You know what I'm saying? And, and, yeah. and that's the reality of it, man. And I, you know, so as coaches, man, as, as, as leaders, because athletes, I believe athletes can change the world, man. They got, they got the power, man. They got, they, they got the influence and they got the power. And I'm talking about high school all the way to professional, middle school all the way to professional, man. They got followers. You got social media. So it's just so important for us to put them, to guide them, to guide them, to guide them to do community service. You know what I'm saying? To guide them, you know what I'm saying? To, to get, to, to partner with companies in the community to give them to um, work certain, you know, uh, jobs to see, you know, different, just different things, man. It's important um, yeah. because I, last thing, if we don't, if we don't, it's going to be a problem, man. Like it's, it's, it's really, really going to be a problem. So it's important, man, for us to, to, um, it's important for us to do it, man. For real. It's going to, yeah, it, I, it, I it, think it's, uh, it, but I'm not. I think it's, uh, key for, you know, us as, as that have been coaches and those of us that are coaches to sound upon other things outside of just basketball. Because so often, um, unfortunately, we are the only male figures in a lot of these young men's lives, right? Um, because they may come from a community that, that, you know, they didn't have a father present. Um, or even if they do have one present, right. there's, there's still um, opportunity, as we know, again, the reason why Black Man Lab even became was that sometimes our sons need to hear other good male figure voices. Right. Um, so, it, along with us, with us wanting to, um, you know, enhance their skill set um, and get them to be able to relate to whatever that next level is, whether that's from grammar school to high school, high school to college, college to pro. Um, along with that, we should also be uh, instilling some different um, life skills for them, as well as supporting them on whatever their, their career endeavors may be. And sometimes we may see those better than they can, you know, because you can see somebody being a really good leader. I can think of there's, there's a gentleman here um, that, that I coached back in Chicago. I coached for Hale Franciscan High School. And uh, he's here, he lives here, and uh, wound up uh, hooking up with Molly Tunji Thurman, who was a great kid um, as a basketball player. Uh, I loved coaching him, um, but for one reason or another, he had to, had to leave the school. And, um, you know, his life took different directions, but he's doing great now. We've had conversation where he, he talks about those years that he had at Pales being significant to him. So um, I, I would say that, that, you know, coaching gives us the opportunity to instill some, some pieces into to young black men that, that – um, it may be missed in other places. So, uh, Travis, what about you, brother? Well, I'm going to piggyback off what uh, both of those guys said. And I, I, when it's all said and done as coaches, it's about relationships with your players. I mean, it's lifelong relationships. Those lifelong relationships lead to the relationships with their teammates and stuff like that, you know. And, and, and uh, Jermaine, you mentioned, like, why aren't there any programs out there that cater to these? That's why I started Academic Athletic Consultant, to help kids navigate whether they're going through their middle school, because as you know, they go from middle school, they go to high school, and whether they're considered a ninth grade prospective student athlete. You understand that? So their clock is ticking. So re one reason I started, you got to get to them earlier and expose them to the academic requirements. You got to expose them to the relationship. And you got to make sure what's understood is that you know we have some some good AAU coaches, and we have some AAU coaches that don't have the kids' best interests and what they can get out of them. 
You know what I'm saying? So as coaches, Coach Harder can expect to that, uh, speak to that. You have to navigate that AAU relationships, but you also got to navigate that high school relationship. And so it's about relationships, you know, with this and getting the players to trust you. I don't know if you know anything about the landscape of uh, the college, but the, you look at the transfer portal out there and just relationships, guys. It's coming down to that relationship factor to where they can trust you or et cetera, who's in their ear or not in their ear to get them to transfer and all that other stuff. So, you know, one of the best things, one of the most important things is, is that player saying, Hey, I trust my coach or that player knows my coach trust him. Like coach mentioned before, it's recruiting that player to your college, recruiting those parents to believe in your system and what you kind of do. And then when it's all said and done, the, 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 the ratio is what? 90 to 95% of African-American males in the predominant sports of basketball and football. So, of course, having a relationship, but being able to expose a relationship like Coach Harder and me with a family, a husband, we take them to church, you, you getting them out of the environment, but you showing them what life is like, whether they coming from the hood and you exposing them. You know, I came from the hood, but I got an opportunity to get out and be exposed. You know what I'm saying? And so even with the relationship, say, okay, cool. As a coach, hey, we're going to try to put everything in front of you. Whether, you know, if you're trying to pursue professional opportunity, we'll put it out there, but we can't guarantee anything. But what thing we can guarantee, we're going to make sure you take care of those academic requirements. We're going to make sure you develop those relationships. That's Coach Hart. He's got an unbelievable pipeline and network with Northwestern. He can get on the phone and call all the relationships now because that Northwestern brand and those relationships established. And that's huge. When it's all said and done, it's the relationship factor. You know, and so one reason I got this student athlete empowerment workshop is because I'm bringing, like I mentioned, Tim Duncan, athletic director at the University of North. We are exposing our young folks with individuals that are not professionals, but that's successful as an AD, a compliance person, right. or academic advisor person, a strength and conditioning coach person, you know, a nutrition person, or sports psychologist person. All those successful individuals, they're just not running up and down the court on the, on the football, or those types. You see what I'm saying? And so I think the, it's a relationship the player and the coach have instilling those uh, great characteristics. They're watching you as a coach, watching how you function, especially when you have team meetings and team functions. You know, I know when I was a head coach, hey, we going to church. You're going to be covered. I'm not going to throw my religion on you, but you're going to see that you're going to be covered with us. We're not going to throw it on you, but you're going to be exposed to it. You're going to be exposed to how you handle yourself in private, handle yourself in public. You, hey, you're not only just... You, you represent not only our institution, you represent me as a coach, you represent your family back home, you represent your city, you represent your state. So it comes down to where those young men are seeing positive coaches like Coach Hart who's been around, positive guys that like you, Coach Jermaine, you getting them as a young age. And then what we got to do, we got to sell our kids on our own. You know, we got to sell them on our own. How many African-American coaches out there, Division One, Division Two, Division Three, on the NBA level and all this other stuff? We dominate the sport, but we got to sell on. And you mentioned earlier, damn, our players have a great platform now. With all this social injustice that's going on, man, it's, it's not the same old. And coaches, our white colleagues, got to get it. They got to get it because these guys realize that they have a voice when it first hit the player at Mississippi State spoke out. Hell, they get made him a day. It was it now? It was Ole Miss. One of those kids spoke out, say, as you can see, Marty, which I've been dealing with, changing, the, getting these statues and stuff. Now I've marched with you guys. These players and Coach Hardy, you mentioned with All In Boat, where you see NABC revenue. <laughs> what are the NABC NCA doing? And just the other day, I met with the NCA and said, Hey, you have a great opportunity to get it right with this HBCU All Star game. You want some diversity and inclusion with the Final Four? And you, and I threw it at him sitting like, I'm like, listen, you mean you get the opportunity to represent our historical black college and universities during the Final Four, 
when there's so much racial unrest going on, so much uneasiness going on, what better way? We, we know you're into making money, but what better way to try to help uh, recognize our, first of all, recognize our, our black college and university, our student athletes, because we know we have some talented kids, you know, that, that play, and we know we have some talented coaches that don't get the notoriety or exposure that our other PWIs or whatever the case may be. So just being able to provide a platform for our student athletes and then be able to like, well, Coach, you said you got a group, man, what you said, the first five years of Coach getting together and doing this call, that's powerful. That's relationships, man. <laughs> that's powerful. I applaud you for that. And then I got a, a bi-weekly call and a month call with a lot of the HBCU coaches. We just call it the HBCU roundtable, just trying to get them together and break bread. So relationships and coaches pouring in these players, man, and just letting them know, hey, if, if you don't get that professional opportunity, here's some other opportunities, a shadowing program, and it's relationships and going in there, being able to network and stuff like that. So I look, you know, those guys, you know, that's the part what I like to pour in as a coach, being able to expose those kids. I, re I really like your focus on relationships, Coach, man. I, I think every one of you all has a, a, a niche that you kind of get strong in, but – for for me, coach, I'm I'm with you. It was always relationships, man. I would I started I, I went into education a few years back and I started teaching this high school, and I I had never talked before in my life. And I and I and I'm teaching, man, and it's a senior, biggest dude in the school, man. Spoke. Uh, he just walk around and we just kind of looking at each other. I'm like, man, I hope this little dude ain't about to kick my ass, man. I don't know what I did, this dude, man. And then just out of nowhere, he was like, "What's up, coach?" I was like, I know you, bro. And he was like, yeah, you coached me at Sandtown about 10 years ago. I was like, wow. wow. Dude, remember me 10 years later. And when I tell you that that dude had my back at this school, like nobody messed with me as a teacher because he was like, nah, Mr. Be Good. He coached Be Good. So those relationships, man, this brother's at Alabama A&M right now. He texts me up. I'm like, yo, you need me to cash up you something? Like, what's going on? You okay? How your grades looking? He got his struggles, but them relationships, man, that's real talk. That's real. So I want, I want to get back into that because you, you all, all have these strong relationships, man. And I, I, I hear your path, how you did it, and who impacted you. Travis, why don't you start, man, because I know you've already talked about specifically how you're doing it. But how are you all getting these kids back now specifically understanding, like Jermaine, like you said, I ain't but 1% of y'all going pro, but there's so many other avenues. So Travis, talk to us. How are you getting the kids back in and be like, look, here's some paths for you guys. Here's some, here's some entrepreneurships. Here's, here's what you can be doing. Here's what coaching can lead to. How are you doing that? You've talked a lot about your relationships and, and, and the groups that you're having. Tell, tell us a little bit. How are you doing that specifically? Well, it's kind of twofold for me, you know. Um, it starts with everything I'm involved with. You know, I do an Instagram live called In the Loop with Travis Williams. So I'm afforded the opportunity to bring in a lot of college coaches. I've had Cream, Josh Passner, Rob Lanier, uh, any, any coach, pretty much a lot of coaches in just to help our young people navigate. So it starts with relationships. I say, Coach, and I get uh, some of these college, these high school coaches and uh, local coaches to come in the show because it's, it's exclusive conversations. And so invite your players and, and the coaches are being able to pour into them. So, so from that, that uh, platform, social media, Instagram live, but also it goes back to uh, the student athlete in, uh, academic empowerment session I'm doing, because when you can get administrators, compliance, individual nutrition coaches or something like that. And what it is is relationship, me being a former high school coach, or a college coach recruiting those coaches to say, hey, you need to get your student athletes on here. You know, a lot of these basketball programs getting ready to get started, what, 26, 27th or something like that. This is a great way for you to show that you really care about these kids' academics, especially if your young kid have goals, dreams, aspirations of participating in the college. Why not expose them to these type of individuals to show, hey, this is what's expected when you come to college. And so... I get a part of different organizations like the Georgia Association of Basketball Coaches. I'm a member of that. The Georgia Minority Coaches. So I sign up a lot of these different organizations, whether or not I'm involved with them or not. Okay. And just try to uh, contact and relationship. 
like during this summer, um, uh, Coach uh, Pierce with the Hawks, he did a Zoom call with all the coaches across the country. So even though I'm not in coaches, but I'm still li looking, listening, networking, and, 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 and making relationships all like this, just like I would devote the first person today was Coach Lloyd Pierce was at the front of the line at State Farm walking you through. Wow. That says a lot. So that stuff rubs off on me for us as leadership, you know, so, and so it, it, it kind of go from the leadership, even with the HBCU All-Star game, we had a, we were doing an HBCU student athlete empowerment at Booker T. Washington. You know what high school that is, Martin Luther King High School. So we were going to have the student athletes pour out into all the graduating seniors at Booker T. High, high School. And so now you got the, from there, you got the official Georgia High School Association. You're just trying to make relationship with contacts and just trying to expose those coaches to different things that are going on. So I think it goes back to, like you said, a relationship with the high school coaches and making sure they understand that, hey, you're always talking about the athletic side. Let's talk about the academic side. Because okay. now it, what switched my gear, what really had me getting a better understanding of it is when I came from Tennessee State to coach in the, on the high school level, it really got a chance to say, you really got to do your homework now as a coach now. Because now the parents are involved. The parents think they know everything. So it goes from relationship with the parents. That was like a, that was like a wake up call for me. Folks say, hey, right. you, you're going to get tired of these parents, et cetera, et cetera. And the one thing they understand, the coach can speak that when the kids go to college, they're not dealing with parents. Yeah. And so you, you, you establish that, uh, unless it's something just major, you got to deal with a parent. But, but when it always comes in with the programs and all that stuff, they're not dealing with it. So it's just, uh, it's just relationship, the relationship with the high school coaches and just making sure you, you you're sharing your vision, you, you're showing your passion. And it's, when it's all said and done, it's about these kids, man. You put your egos aside, your personalities aside, and if you're in it for the right reason, you know it's about the kid, and that's what you got to decipher. You know? That's what's up. That's what's up. Co Coach Hardy, what about you, man? What is your way of, of just kind of getting in the kid's ear, using the space you have and saying, hey, here's some paths for you guys. Like, how are you doing that? Yeah, there's a few things. It start with the very beginning in the recruiting process for us, uh, just being quite frank, there's a lot of coaches out here lying to these young men and lying to their families. And I give you the, the biggest example for, for you all watching, when a coach starts uh, showing you players that played for them 10 years ago, that's your size, and they say they're going to make you that person uh, because that person made it to the league. Like, ask them how come they haven't done that every year since that person graduated. <laughs> what Jay-Z say, they say they want to make home or make another home. Uh, it, it's just, it's remarkable how many coaches will use that line. And unfortunately, in our space, a lot of, a lot of people fall for the okie doke. Um, and, and so one thing for me, I've always made, uh, I've insisted upon and I've been lucky to work for great head coaches, Josh Pastor, John Thompson, the third Phil Carmody. You know, we don't lie to kids. I've never uh, sold a kid a bill of goods. Uh, you know, what we say we're going to do it, it's authentic. And uh, you, you can tell, like, look at the places I've worked uh, in, in Northwestern where I went to school and then going back to work there. Great academic school, city of Chicago, great brand of basketball. Georgetown, great brand of basketball, great academics. You got D.C., Georgia Tech, great academics. Atlanta, great band of, brand of basketball. Same thing, Patriot League, basketball, Baltimore. You can utilize a major city. And, and, and you, know, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, our kids are going to get a great education. That's what our league foundation on. And so I hold that near and dear to my heart. That's why we haven't had any transfers in or out. <laughs> um, and... and, and you know, I don't, I would rather lose a recruit if, if he's waiting for me to tell him how great he is and how, how much I'm going to make him Josh Akogi just because I got a chance to coach Josh Akogi. I can't make you Josh Akogi. We didn't even know Josh Akogi was going to be him. He made himself. We worked with him. We put him in an environment, but he made himself. And so for me, it's, it's, it's recruiting young men that have that, that, that realization um, and, and, if, if we can get off to that great start, 
then we can help them navigate their careers. And so one thing for me, I'm really passionate about internships. Okay. I'm really passionate about our guys doing great. Yeah, I'm really passionate about our guys doing great internships, uh, getting real life experience. You have to, I mentioned earlier, I worked at JP Morgan. I got a chance to see that world uh, from the inside. Um, and, and, you know, I, we don't have to go into great details now, but I'm sure you guys saw, I know there was a big controversy a few weeks ago with the article uh, about the Wells Fargo CEO, Charlie Sharp, yeah. who, uh, who talked about how, you know, yeah. there's not enough, or, you know, the way he worded it, there's yeah. not enough black people in the pool to choose from. And, and what I can say straight up, and it might be an unpopular opinion, I know Charlie Sharp, I don't know him well, but when I was at JP Morgan, he was at JP Morgan uh, as the head of the retail bank. And I know that that whole management team cared about diversity. What he's saying is real. And I said this to my other head coaches the other day. Are we, can we say every year we're sending out four to five young men that are on a path to become a, an executive at a bank? And if we're not doing it, then who is? And so that's got to become our mission is we got to prepare our young men and our young women to be that pool because I do believe that people are seeking it. I do believe that there is opportunity out there. And, and I know that there's plenty of folks out there, but we got to make sure that we're adding to that pool and, and not deterring away from it. Thanks. Appreciate that, Coach. Appreciate that. Guys, we're, we're uh, Coach Jermaine, I'm going to let you answer. And then we're, we're running really close to the edge of time here. So, Coach Jermaine, go ahead and answer that for me. And then uh, Marty's going to gonna close it out with uh, a quick question for each of you. So, Jermaine, what about you, bro? Well, <clears throat> um, you know, I have an organization called Pro Conscious Athletes. And um, um, I get the guys to get into the community. Like, I got um, Wendell Carter, Wendell Carter's senior year. Um, and... Um, Girl, her, her name is Cassie. I can't remember her last name, but she's at um University of Tennessee now. They were both McDonald's All Americans, and I brought them up to the um this uh, Andrew and Walter Young Family YMCA, and this is just an example. They read to the kids. You know what I'm saying? They 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 went down to the preschool with a book and read to the kids. You know, um, went and talked to the the um the the middle schoolers. Um, I I. I I took a group of athletes to Hosea Feed the Hungry. You know what I'm saying? And I really had planned on, before this COVID thing hit, man, really planned on doing some stuff. Um, but Coach Trav, man, we're going to talk offline, man. We're going to, we, 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 we about to rock out, bro. <laughs> um, but um, I just think it's important for these guys to get a sense of that giving back. You know what I'm saying? They don't it, to try to get them to do it when they really do it when they become pros. Um, they really don't understand. It it, 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 it becomes for show. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it just becomes for show. They, you know, it's kind of like a, a a room full of people that you know they talking to a room full of people that really don't really need that impact. You know what I'm saying? So. We, it's important for them to understand to go back, go back to where, you know, you can make an impact, you know what I mean? And really do service. Yeah. Go feed yeah. the homeless, man. Go sit and have a conversation with a homeless dude. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like humility, man. Like, you know, one thing that athletes don't have a lot of times, or let me say this. They have a spirit of entitlement because a lot of stuff is given to them on their on their journey. You know, just being an athlete. So I just think it's important, and and and, and I really my whole thing is service, man. Community service and, love it, love it, and, and partnerships with businesses. And because coach, coach Hart, just imagine if we could get them guys to do internships while they're in high school. You know what I mean? Like, absolutely. You know, like man, it, it'll change their whole. It'll change their, their their whole scope, man. You know what I mean? And those are the type of things we gotta. Those are the type of things we gotta do for these guys, man. And 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 females, man. It's <laughs> you know, it's both sides. Now you guys are dropping some some really critical stuff, man. Relationships, internships, service, being in the community, man. That's 
that's amazing, man. I appreciate, I appreciate what you guys have said this evening. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, the, the, the undertake here is that uh, as leaders uh, in coaching, it's essential that we use, utilize our eyes to find the next level of leader, right? Um, what you're talking about there, Jermaine, and, and getting um, young folks to be in front, right? So you get somebody, um, a young kid who's a really good athlete, uh, so often they're just stuck in their own little shell, right? And this is just young folks in general. We think about ourselves at that age. What do we think about, you know, from the age of probably, you know, being born to 25, you didn't really think about much other than who? Yourself, right? Um, but then when you start to realize that life is not about you, um, or something makes you realize that life is not about you, then it becomes a life of service. What can I put out to get back, right? Um, so that's that's the piece that I think our young folks need to hear um, and, and, and take on as, as leaders. And we're, again, we're talking about coaching here today. Um, we ideally want a lot of our young folks that, that we've touched to move into these kind of coaching positions because it's a position of leadership that can change other young folks' lives to move forward. Man, we are way up against the clock, fellas. So um, what I want to do is, well, we have a tradition, a couple of things here. Number one, we always close out um, talking about um, um, uh, our rituals, our habits, rituals, and disciplines that we do on a daily basis that keep us moving forward, keep us, um, you know, kind of grounded in the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to ask that question for you guys. And if you could hit it real quick, just what your habits, rituals, and disciplines are that you do kind of on a daily basis, because we know that what we do is not by accident. We know that it's, it's, it's the practice, right? As coaches, you guys know this. It's the practice that keeps you moving forward and getting better at whatever you do in life. And that's what those habits, rituals, and disciplines are. So, uh, Travis, if you hit it real quick on what your habits, rituals, and disciplines are. Yeah, definitely. Every time I wake up, I always got to get thanks for the Lord. Get up and pray in the morning. I get up and pray in the morning, pray with my wife. She's across the bed from me. I'm across the bed from her. So we do that. And we get our children, you know, of course, they virtual learning. So it's, it's, it's not then after that, putting on that father hat, making sure they organize and and family, but there's there's a list I call it. It's seven buckets, and I got it uh, from like Coach Randy Peel, the head co you know, associate head coach of Texas Southern. Man, it's like and 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 I just briefly go, over, but seven buckets. You know, the prayer life, just your, your meditation life, um, you you know, just just a calm life, just just getting that 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 reading space. You know, at least try to read throughout the day. You know, getting the workout in throughout the day. And, um, and, and I try to do that every day. And, um, and also, this is my big thing. I don't listen to too much, mu you know, just, just music that doesn't pour into me. I'm a big gospel. My wife said, why do you work out to gospel music? Gospel music gets me in my spirit. So when I'm up in the morning, if I'm in there working out, I'm working out the gospel music. Or when I'm taking a shower, I take my phone in there, it's the gospel music. So someday... It, it, it's like everyday bucket is I'm getting that gospel music just just pouring into my spirit, man. And so it's not like I don't listen to other music, but for me, I have to at least listen to my gospel music uh, day. And so just and just writing out the list, you know, getting prepared for some of the uh, responsibilities that I got to do, and it's just putting it to action, you know. Awesome, man. And I, I can see how that that gospel music gets to your spirit and gets your spirit yourself rolling every day. Yeah, I hear you on that. Um, Brother Hardy, how about you? Yeah, well, thank you all for having me. This has been awesome. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come speak to you all. For me, um, obviously, uh, like Travis said, it starts with the family uh, in terms of I got a beautiful wife, four children, and I got to make sure that uh, I'm touching them, not just, uh, you know, through through being here, but, but through real conversations and interactions. Um, you know, I read a lot of news um, and I read all different uh, types from business to politics to what's going on just overall in day to day to sports. Um, I, I like to be in the know of, of, of what's going on in, in, in society 
uh, and that's happening now. And so uh, I make sure I do that every day. And I'd say, you know, a lot of other things, but probably the most important thing for me before I, I start to communicate with my, with my staff or with my student athletes, I'm, I'm real big on self-reflection and self-evaluation. Um, and, and so I really dig in to sort of how can I uh, do better? How can I be better today? Uh, and so that, that sort of self-evaluation is something that I really lock in every day. Absolutely. That's a good one, man. That's, that's one that I, I 100% agree with you on, man. What I do good, what I do not so good, what will I do different? That's, that's, that's one of mine that I just have to do on a regular basis so that I just feel like I'm getting better for the world, right? Um, so good stuff. Appreciate that, brother. Uh, Jermaine, how about you, bro? Um, Coach Trav, thank you, man, for the gospel. Because maybe, I, you know, I listen to T.I. and uh, <laughs> Jay-Z and, you know, and, you know, I preach. I'm going to really like tomorrow in my workout, I'm about to throw on that gospel, bro. That really, when you Text said me. that. I see a good list. I see a good list. Text me. Yeah, bro, for real, when you said that, man, it hit my spirit, man. I'm mm-hmm. like, you know, I'm listening. I'm I'm listening to guys talk about punching dudes in the face while I'm working out. You know, that's not good. I need to listen to some gospel, man. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I appreciate that, man. Um, but um, basically, man, I wake up, I meditate. I, you know, I, I take meditation very, very seriously because I feel like it's the, it, it's the way that we get away from the flesh. <laughs> it's like a secret. It's like a secret place only where you can go with God to 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 get in tune and get your instruction, what you're supposed to do, and just be able. Because meditation, along with working out, but meditation allows you. It prepares you for just when things come at you. Um, you attract, it, it, it helps attract everything you need because it's like, like I say, it's a chance that you, 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 you're more of a spiritual being than a physical being, you know what I'm saying, at that time. Um, so that's important. And then I get into my list. I always got a, a list of things to do. Um, check them off, man. And, um, you know, everything that everybody else said, just the self-reflection, you know what I mean? The, the, just the, Thankful, man. You know what I'm saying? We, if, we, if we haven't learned anything right now, and all of this that has gone on, man, is to be thankful and to, you know, hey, man, that is, while we're here, we, got, we, have a, we have a purpose, man. We can't waste time. We got to handle it. You know what I'm saying? I, I appreciate, man, I, when, who, who texted me today? Was that you, Marty, that texted yeah. me? Yeah. Brother, thank you, man. Like, I saw it. I was like, oh. <laughs> and I just happened. It was funny. I usually train in that night. Um, I just happened. I didn't want to train tonight. So I had already I, I called it off. And you hit me. I'm like, oh, man, thank you. I, I, hey, this, man. this is food Listen, for my soul, we, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't thank you guys enough for being on. Um, you know, we this is a different space, of course, than what we normally do. Um, you know, Brother Jermaine, Brother Travis, you guys have been in the space. Um, and brother, brother Tavares, I'm going to hold you, man. I know you, you're you not here, but, man, we're well, going to have to get to when we get back to doing our live Black Man Labs, man. We want you to be in the space because it's a unique, unique kind of an environment, and, and it's one that, that enriches your soul. And I, that's, I can tell that that's why, you know, Brother Jermaine wanted to be on here, man. So I want to say thank you all so much for being on. Um, every week we have a way that we close out. There is a... Uh, uh, she's an ancestor now, um, and she's one of the leaders of uh, the Pan African um, group of in Cobra. Her name was um, Sister Ingeria in Algani. And every closeout of every meeting, she had a tradition that she did where everybody would lock arms together and they'd say, um, We are a link in the chain. So I'm going to ask you guys. Uh, normally, if we were in the, together, we'd all be locked arms at the end of our session. But tonight, 
Um, since we're virtual, I'm going to ask you guys to hold your arms up and then just repeat after me if you could. I have a link in this chain. I have a link in this chain. And it won't break here. And it won't break here. I have a link in this chain. I'm a link in this train. And it won't break here. And it won't break here. We are links in this chain. We, we are links in this chain. And it won't break here. And it won't break here. I say. Thank you all. I appreciate you all. Thank you for being links in the chain. Um, make sure you drop your information um, in, in the chat group here. And um, we will call on you all again. Um, in the future. I know there'll be other topic matter that we would love to bring you guys in on. So we'll reach out to you again in the future. Um, so thank you again. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much.